Hello, and welcome to the Camden Public Library's Friday Explorations Read Aloud. My name is Joseph Cote, and once again, I'll be your reader today. Let's test a few memories. Sergeant Joe Friday, Sergeant Joe Friday from Dragnet. I'm afraid that dates me, doesn't it? So if you're my age, you'll remember Sergeant Joe Friday. But the line that is most memorable from that very popular television show was just the facts, lady, just the facts. Well, today I'm going to make just the facts in my introduction uh, because I want to get through it as quickly as I can. And I'll tell you why. The book we're going to read today is The Goldfinch. Uh, some of you perhaps read it uh, when it came out and was ever so popular in 2013. Uh, fascinatingly enough, uh, like most books, the first uh, chapter is uh, setting the stage, introducing you to characters, putting it in perspective. Uh, but the first 47 pages of this 771 page book absolutely leaves the, an indelible mark on the reader. Uh, and I'm hoping, I'm hoping to get through all 47 pages. That's probably beyond my ability, uh, but I'm going to try in the time that we have. Uh, so the facts, only the facts. Uh, the book was written by Donna Tart, T-A-R-T-T. -T -T, uh, and in one sentence, one would have to say a boy of 13 spends the rest of his life of abandonment with little guidance doing things wrong, then setting things right. I know that's terribly vague, but let me tell you a little bit about the author if you're not familiar with her. Uh, she is an American fiction writer, uh, lived her formative years in the Mississippi Delta area, a town of Granada. Her alma mater, Bennington College, she published her first novel, The Secret History in 1992. We waited for a bit for her second novel all the way to 2002, and that was called The Little Friend. And we waited even longer for her third and most highly respected novel, The Goldfinch. So her third novel was 2013. I quote her saying, uh, the job of the novelist is to invent, to embroider, to color, to embellish, to entertain, to make things up. The art of what I do is not in research nor even recollection, but primarily in invention. Just the facts, let me tell you about the book itself. Despite polarization uh, when the book came out and critical reception, the accolades came aplenty. Uh, it was 30 weeks on the New York Times bestseller list and the same on the London Sunday Times hardcover fiction bestseller list. In France, it was number one in Edition Plon, uh, which is comparable to uh, the New York Times bestseller list. In Finland, it was number one on the bestseller list. In Germany, it was number two in Der Spiegel bestseller list. And in Italy, it dropped down a tad, but number 10 on the bestseller list. Awards starting at the top. The book won the 2014 Pulitzer Prize for fiction. It also won the 2014 Andrew Carnegie Medal for excellence in fiction. The New York Times Book Review had one of the 10 best books of 2013. Even Amazon 2013 best book of the year from a sales point of view. It was shortlisted for the National Book Critics Circle Award, also shortlisted for the prestigious Bailey's Women's Prize for Fiction. Then it went on to film, a film adaptation not long ago in 2019 by Warner Brothers and Amazon Studios. So the book has certainly had its great attention and there are many, many reasons why but I'm not going to go any further than that. The facts, lady, just the facts. We're going to start immediately uh, on the first page of the book uh, and hopefully get to the episode that drives the rest of the book uh, without my telling you anything more about plot. I'll try to fill you in a couple of more enticing things at the end. So, 
The Goldfinch uh, by Donna Tart, 2013. While I was still in Amsterdam, I dreamed about my mother for the first time in years. I'd been shut up in my hotel for more than a week, afraid to telephone anybody or go out, and my heart scrambled and floundered at even the most innocent noises. Elevator bell, rattle of the minibar cart, even church clocks tolling the hour, a dark edge to the clangor, an inwrought fairy tale sense of doom. By day, I sat on the floor of the bed, straining to, to puzzle out the Dutch language news on television, which was hopeless since I knew not a word of Dutch. And when I gave up, I sat by the window, staring out at the canal with my camel's hair coat thrown over my clothes. For I'd left New York in a hurry and the things I'd brought weren't warm enough, even indoors. Outside all this activity and cheer, it was Christmas, lights twinkling on the canal bridges at nights, red-cheeked dumb and Harren, scarves flying in the icy wind, clattered down the cobblestones with Christmas trees lashed to the backs of their bicycles. In the afternoon, an amateur band played Christmas carols that hung tinny and fragile in the winter air. Chaotic room service trays, too many cigarettes, lukewarm vodka from duty free. During these restless shut up days, I got to know every inch of the room as a prisoner comes to know his cell. It was my first time in Amsterdam. I'd been almost nothing, I'd known, seen almost nothing of the city and yet the room itself in its bleak, drafty, sun scrubbed beauty gave a keen sense of Northern Europe a model of the Netherlands in miniature, whitewash and Protestant probity, co-mingled with deep dyed luxury brought in merchant ships from the East. I spent an unreasonable amount of time scrutinizing a tiny pair of gilt framed oils hanging over the bureau, one of peasants skating on an ice pond by a church, the other a sailboat flouncing on a choppy winter sea. Decorative copies, nothing special, though I studied them as if they held, encrypted, some key to the secret heart of the old Flemish masters. Outside, sleet tapped at the window panes and drizzled over the canal, and though the brocades were rich and the carpet was soft, still the winter light carried a chilly tone of 1943, privation and austerities, weak tea without sugar, and hungry to bed. Early every morning when it was still blackout, before the extra clerks came on duty and the lobby started filling up, I walked downstairs for the newspapers. The hotel staff moved with hushed voices and quiet footsteps, eyes gliding across me coolly as if they didn't quite see me. The American man in room 27 who never came down during the day. And I tried to reassure myself that the night manager, dark suit, crew cut, horn rim glasses, would probably go to some lengths to avert trouble or avoid a fuss. The Herald Tribune had no news of my predicament, but the story was all over the Dutch papers. Dense blocks of foreign print, which hung tantalizingly just beyond the reach of my comprehension. I went upstairs and got back into bed, fully clad because the room was so cold, and spread the papers out on the coverlet. Photographs of police cars, crime scene tape, even the captions were impossible to decipher, and although they didn't appear to have my name, there was no way to know if they had a description of me or if they were withholding information from the public. The room, the radiator, olive green water in the canal. Because I was cold and ill and much of the time at a loss what to do, I'd neglected to bring a book as well as warm clothes, I stayed in bed most of the day. Night seemed to fall in the middle of the afternoon. Often, amidst the crackle of strewn newspapers, I drifted in and out of sleep, and my dreams for the most part were muddied with the same 
indeterminate anxiety that bled into my waking hours. Court cases, luggage burst open on the tarmac with my clothes scattered everywhere and endless airport corridors where I ran for planes I knew I'd never make. Thanks to my fever, I had a lot of weird and extremely vivid dreams, sweats where I thrashed around hardly knowing if it was day or night. But on the last and worst of these nights, I dreamed about my mother, a quick, mysterious dream that felt more like a visitation. I was in Hobie's shop, or more accurately, some haunted dream space, staged like a sketchy version of the shop. When she came up suddenly behind me, so I saw her reflection in a mirror. At the sight of her, I was paralyzed with happiness. It was her, down to the most minute detail, the very pattern of her freckles. She was smiling at me, more beautiful and yet not older, black hair and funny upward quirk of her mouth, not a dream, but a presence that filled the whole room, a force all her own, a living otherness. And as much as I wanted to, I knew I couldn't turn around, that to look at her directly was to violate the laws of her world and mine. She had come to me the only way she could, and our eyes met in the glass for a long, still moment. But just as she seemed about to speak with what seemed a combination of amusement, affection, and exasperation, a vapor rolled between us and I woke up. Things would have turned out better if she had lived. As it was, she died when I was a kid. And though everything that's happened to me since then is thoroughly my own fault, still, when I lost her, I lost sight of any landmark that may have led me someplace happier to some more populated or congenial life. Her death, the dividing mark, before and after. And though it's a bleak thing to admit all these years later, still, I've never met anyone who made me feel loved the way she did. Everything came alive in her company. She cast a charm theatrical light about her so that to see anything through her eyes was to see it brighter colors than ordinary. I remember a few weeks before she died, eating a late supper with her in an Italian restaurant down in the village and how she grasped my sleeve at the sudden, almost painful loveliness of a birthday cake with lit candles being carried in procession from the kitchen, faint circle of light wavering in across the dark ceiling, and then the cake set down to blaze amidst the family, beautifying an old lady's face, smiles all round, Waiters stepping away with their hands behind their backs, just an ordinary birthday dinner you might see anywhere in an inexpensive downtown restaurant. And I'm sure I wouldn't even remember it had she not died so soon after. But I thought about it again and again after her death, and indeed I'd probably think about it all my life. That candlelit dinner, a tableau vivant of the daily commonplace happiness that was lost when I lost her. She was beautiful too. That's almost secondary, but still she was. When she came to New York fresh from Kansas, she worked part-time as a model, though she was too uneasy in front of the camera to be very good at it. Whatever she had, it didn't translate to film. And yet she was wholly herself, a rarity. I cannot recall ever seeing another person who really resembled her. She had black hair, fair skin that freckled in summer, china blue eyes with a lot of light in them. And in the slant of her cheekbones, there was such an eccentric mixture of the tribal and the Celtic. Twilight that sometimes people guessed she was Icelandic. In fact, she was half Irish, half Cherokee, from a town in Kansas near the Oklahoma border. And she liked to make me laugh by calling herself an Okie, 
even though she was as glossy and nervy and stylish as a racehorse. That exotic character unfortunately comes out a little too stark and unforgiving in photographs. Her freckles covered with makeup, her hair pulled back in a ponytail at the nape of her neck, like some nobleman in the tale of Genji. And what doesn't come across at all is her warmth, her merry, unpredictable quality, which is what I loved about her most. It's clear from the stillness she emanates in pictures how much she mistrusted the camera. She gives off a watchful, tigerish air of steeling herself against attack. But in life, she wasn't like that. She moved with a thrilling quickness, gestures sudden and light, always perched on the edge of her chair like some long, elegant marsh bird about to startle and fly away. I loved the sandalwood perfume she wore, rough and unexpected. And I loved the rustle of her starched skirt when she swooped down to kiss me on the forehead. And her laugh was enough to make you want to kick over what you were doing and follow her down the street. Wherever she went, men looked at her out of the corner of their eyes. And sometimes they used to look at her in a way that bothered me a little. Her death was my fault. Other people have always been a little too quick to assure me that it wasn't. And Yes, only a kid who could have known terrible accident, rotten luck could have happened to anyone. It's all perfectly true. And I don't believe a word of it. It happened in New York, April 10th, 14 years ago. Even my hand box at the date. I had to push to write it down just to keep the pen moving on the paper. I used to be a perfectly ordinary day, but now it sticks up on the calendar like a rusty nail. If the day had gone as planned, it would have faded into the sky unmarked, swallowed without a trace along with the rest of my eighth grade year. What would I remember of it now, little or nothing? But of course, the texture of that morning is clearer than the present down to the drenched, wet feel of the air. It had rained in the night, a terrible storm. Shops were flooded and a couple of subway stations closed. And the two of us were standing on the squelching carpet outside our apartment building with her favorite doorman, Goldie, who adored her, walked backwards down 57th with his arm up, whistling for a taxi. Cars whooshed by in sheets of dirty spray. Rain swollen clouds tumbled high above the skyscrapers blowing and shifting to patches of blue, clear sky. And down below on the street, beneath the exhaust fumes, the wind felt damp and soft like spring. Ah, he's full, my lady, Goldie called over the roar of the street, stepping out of the way as a taxi splashed round the corner and shut its light off. He was the smallest of the doormen, a wan, thin, lively little guy, light-skinned Puerto Rican, a former featherweight boxer. Though he was pouchy in the face from drinking, sometimes he turned up on the night shift smelling of J and B. Still, he was wiry and muscular and quick, always kidding around, always having a cigarette break on the corner, shifting from foot to foot and blowing on his white gloved hands when it was cold, telling jokes in Spanish and cracking the other doormen up. You in a big hurry this morning, he asked my mother. His name tag said Bert D, but everyone called him Goldly because of his gold tooth and because his last name, De Oro, meant gold in Spanish. No, plenty of time, we're fine. But she looked exhausted with her hands were shaky as the, she retied her scarf, which snapped and fluttered in the wind. Goldie must have noticed this himself because he glanced over at me, backed up evasively against the concrete planter in front of the building, looked anywhere but at her and an air of slight disapproval. You're not taking the train, he said to me. Oh, we've got some errands, said my mother, without much conviction when she realized I didn't know what to say. Normally, I didn't pay much attention to her clothes, 
But what she had on that morning, white trench coat, filmy pink scarf, black and white two-tone loafers, is so firmly buried into my memory that now it's difficult for me to remember her any other way. I was 13. I hate to remember how awkward we were with each other that last morning, stiff enough for the doorman to notice. Any other time we would have been talking companionably enough, but that morning we didn't have much to say to each other because I'd been suspended from school. They'd called her at her office the day before. She'd come home silent and furious, and the awful thing was that I didn't even know what I'd been suspended for, although I was about 75% sure that Mr. Bremen, en route from his office to the teacher's lounge, had looked out the window of the second floor landing at exactly the wrong moment and seen me smoking on school property, or rather seen me standing around with Tom Cable while he smoked, which at my school amounted to practically the same offense. My mother hated smoking. Her parents, whom I loved hearing stories about and who had unfairly died before I'd had the chance to know them, had been affable horse trainers who traveled around the West and raised Morgan horses for a living. Cocktail drinking, canasta playing lively, who went to the Kentucky Derby every year and kept cigarettes and silver boxes around the house. Then my grandmother doubled over and started coughing blood one day when she came in from the stables. And for the rest of my mother's teenage years, there had been oxygen tanks on the front porch and bedroom shades that stayed pulled down. But as I feared and not without reason, Tom's cigarette was only the tip of the iceberg. I'd been in trouble at school for a while. It had all started or began to snowball rather when my father had run off and left my mother and me some months before. We'd never liked him much and my mother and I were generally much happier without him, but other people seemed shocked and distressed at the above way, above, abrupt way he abandoned us without money, child support, or forwarding address. And the teachers at my school on the Upper West Side had been so sorry for me, so eager to extend their understanding and support that they'd given me, a scholarship student, all sorts of special allowances and delayed deadlines and second and third chances, feeding out the rope over a matter of months until I'd managed to lower myself into a very deep hole. So the two of us, my mother and I, had been called in for a conference at school. The meeting wasn't until 11.30, but since my mother had been forced to take the morning all off, we were heading to the west side early for breakfast, and I expected a serious talk, and so she could buy a birthday present for someone she worked with. She had been up till 2.30 the night before, her face tense in the glow of the computer, writing emails and trying to clear the desks, the decks of her morning out of the office. I don't know about you, Goldie was saying to my mother rather fiercely, but I say enough with all this spring and damp already. Rain, rain, he shivered, pulling his collar closer, closer in pantomime and glanced at the sky. I think it's supposed to clear up this afternoon. Yeah, I know, but I'm ready for summer, rubbing his hands. People leave town, they hate it, complain about the heat, but me, I'm a tropical bird. Hotter and the better. Bring it on. Clapping, backing on his heels down the street. And tell you what I love the best is how it quiets out here. Come July, building all empty and sleepy, everyone away, you know? Snapping his fingers, cabs speeding by. That's my vacation. But don't you burn up out here? My standoffish dad had hated this about her, her tendency to engage in conversation with waitresses, doormen, the wheezy old guys at the dry cleaners. I mean, in winter, at least you can put on an extra coat. Listen, you're working the door in winter. I'm telling you, it gets cold. <laughs> I don't care how many coats and hats you put on. You're standing out here in January, February, and the wind is blowing in off the river. <laughs> Agitated, gnawing at my thumbnail, I stared at the cabs flying past Goldie's upraised arm. 
I knew that it was going to be an excruciating wait until the conference at 11.30, and it was all I could do to stand still and not blurt out incriminating questions. I had no idea what they might spring on my mother and me once they had us in the office. The very word conference suggested a convocation of authorities, accusations and face downs, a, popular, a possible expulsion. If I lost my scholarship, it would be catastrophic. We were broke since my dad had left. We barely had money for rent. Above all else, I was worried sick that Mr. Bremen had found out somehow that Tom Cable and I had been breaking into empty vacation houses when I went to stay with him in the Hamptons. I say breaking, though we hadn't forced a lock or done any damage. Tom's mother was a real estate agent. We let ourselves in with spare keys lifted from the rack in her office. Mainly we'd snoop through closets and poked around in dresser drawers, but we'd also taken some things, beer from the fridge, some Xbox games, and a DVD, Jet Lie Unleashed, and money, about $92 total, crumbled fives and tens from a kitchen jar, piles of pocket change in the laundry rooms, Whenever I thought about this, I felt nauseating, nauseated. It was months since I'd been out to Tom's, but though I tried to tell myself that Mr. Brayman could possibly know about us going into those houses, how could he know? My imagination was flying and darting around in panic zigzags. I was determined not to tell on Tom, even though I wasn't so sure he hadn't told on me, but that left me in a tight spot. How could I have been so stupid? Breaking and entering was a crime. People went to jail for it. For hours the night before, I lay awake, tortured, flopping back and forth and watching the rain slap in ragged gusts against my window pane and wondering what to say if confronted. But how could I defend myself when I had, didn't even know what they knew? Goldie heaved a big sigh, put his hand down and walked backward on his heels to where my mother stood. Incredible, he said to her with one jaded eye on the street. We got the flooding down in Soho. You heard about that, right? And Carlos was saying they've got some streets blocked off over by the UN. Gloomily, I watched a crowd of workers streaming off the Craftswatt town bus as joyless as a swarm of hornets. We might have had better luck if we'd walked west a block or two, but my mother and I had enough experience of Goldie to know that he would be offended if we struck out on our own. But just then, so suddenly that we all jumped, a cab with its light on skidded across the lane to us, throwing up a fan of sewer smelling water. Watch it, said Goldie, leaping aside as the taxi plowed to a stop. And then observing that my mother had no umbrella, Wait, he said, starting into the lobby to the collection of lost and forgotten umbrellas that he saved in a brass can by the fireplace and redistributed it on rainy days. No, my mother called, fishing in her bag for her tiny candy striped collapsible. Don't bother, Goldie. I'm all set. Goldie sprang back to the cab and shut the door, the taxi door after her. Then he leaned down and knocked on the window. You have a blessed day, he said. I like to think of myself as a perceptive person, as I suppose we all do. And in setting all this down, it's tempting to pencil a shadow gliding in overhead. But I was blind and deaf to the future. My single crushing worry was the meeting at school. When I'd called Tom to tell him I'd been suspended whispering on the landline, she had taken away my cell phone, he hadn't seemed particularly surprised to hear it. Look, it said, cutting me off. Don't be stupid, Theo. Nobody knows a thing. Just keep your mouth shut. And before I could get out another word, he said, sorry, I've got to go, and hung up. In the cab, I tried to crack my window to get some air. No luck. It smelled like someone had been changing dirty diapers back there, or maybe even taken an actual accident, and then tried to cover it up with a bunch of coconut air freshener that smelled like suntan lotion. The seats were greasy and patched with duct tape, and the shocks were nearly gone. 
Whenever we struck a bump, my teeth rattled, and so did the religious claptrap dangling from the rear view mirror, medallions, a curved sword in miniature dancing on a plastic chain, and a turbaned bearded guru who gazed into the back seat with piercing eyes, palmed, raised in benediction. Along Park Avenue, ranks of red tulips stood at attention as we sped by. Bollywood pop turned down to a low, almost subliminal whine, spiraled and sparkled hypnotically just at the threshold of my hearing. The leaves were just coming out on the trees. Delivery boys from D'Agostino's and Gustedi's pushed carts laden with groceries. Harried executive women in heels plunged down the sidewalk, dragging reluctant kidney governors behind them. A uniformed worker swept debris from the gutter into a dustpin on a stick. Lawyers and stockbrokers held their palms out and knit their brows as they looked up to the sky. As we jolted up the avenue, my mother looking miserable, clutching at the armrest to brace herself, I stared out the window at the dyspeptic workaday faces worried looking people in raincoats milling in grim throngs at the sidewalks, people drinking coffee from cardboard cups and talking on cell phones and glancing furtively side to side, and tried hard not to think of all the unpleasant fates that might be about to befall me, some of them involving juvenile court or jail. The cab swung into a sharp sudden turn onto 86th Street my mother slid into me and grabbed my arm, and I saw she was clammy and pale as a cod. Are you carsick? I said, forgetting my own troubles for the moment. She had a woeful fixed expression that I recognized all too well. Her lips were pressed tight, her forehead was glistening, and her eyes were glassy and huge. She started to say something and then clapped her hand to her mouth as the cab lurched to a stop at the light throwing us forward and then back hard against the seat. Hang on, I said to her, and then leaned up and knocked on the greasy plexiglass so that the driver, a turbaned Sikh, stared, started in surprise. Look, I called through the guild, this, this is fine, we'll get out here, okay? The Sikh, reflected in the garlanded mirror, gazed at me steadily. You want to stop here? Yes, please, but this is not the address you gave. I know, but this is good, I said, glancing back at my mother, mascara smeared, wilted looking, scrabbling about her bag for her wallet. Is she all right, said the cab driver doubtfully. Yes, yes, she's fine, we just need to get out, thanks. With trembling hands, my mother produced a crumple of damp, of damp looking dollars and pushed them through the grill. As the Sikh slid his hand through and palmed them, resignedly looking away, I climbed out, holding the door open for her. My mother stumbled a little, stepping onto the curb, and I caught her arm. Are you okay? I said to her timidly as the cab sped away. We were on Upper Fifth Avenue by the mansions facing the park. Excuse me. <clears throat> She took a deep breath, then wiped her brow and squeezed my arm. So sorry. <coughs> Phew, she said, <coughs> fanning her face with her palm. Her forehead was shiny and her eyes were still a little unfocused. She had the slightly ruffled aspect of a seabird blown off course. <coughs> Sorry, still got the wobblies. <sighs> Thank God we're out of that cab. I'll be fine, I just need some. People streamed around us on the windy corner. Schoolgirls in uniform laughing and running and dodging around us. Nannies pushing elaborate prams with babies seated in pairs and threes. A harried, lawyerly father brushed past us, towing his small son by the wrist. No, Brayden, I heard him say to the boy who trotted to keep up. You shouldn't think that way. It's more important to have a job you like. We stepped aside.
to avoid the soap suds that a janitor was dumping from the pail on the sidewalk in front of his building. Tell me, said my mother, fingertips at her temple, was it just me or was that cab unbelievably nasty? Hawaiian tropic and baby poo? Honestly, <clears throat> fanning the air in front of her face, it would have been okay if not for all the stopping and starting. I was perfectly fine and then it just hit me. <clears throat> Why don't you ever just ask if you can sit in the front seat? You sound just like your father. I looked away embarrassed, for I had heard it too, a hint of the annoying know-it-all tone. Let's walk over to Madison and find some place for you to sit down, I said. I was starving to death and there was a diner over there I liked. But with a shudder, almost a visible wave of nausea, she shook her head, air. Dashing mascara smudges from under her eyes. The air feels good. Sure, I said, a bit too quickly, anxious to be accommodating. Whatever. I was trying hard to be agreeable, but my mother, fitful and woozy, had picked up on my tone. She looked at me closely, trying to figure out what I was thinking. This was another bad habit we'd fallen into, thanks to years of life with my father, trying to read each other's mind. What, she said, is there some place you want to go? Um, no, not really, I said, taking a step backwards, looking around in my consternation. Even though I was hungry, I felt it no position to insist on anything. I'll be fine, just give me a minute. Maybe blinking and agitated, what did she want? What would please her? How about we go sit in the park? To my relief, she nodded. All right then, she said, in what I thought of her Mary Poppins voice, but just till I catch my breath. And we started down toward the sidewalk at 79th Street, past topiaries and Baroque planters, ponderous doors laced with ironwork. The light had faded to an industrial gray and the breeze was as heavy as tea kettle steam. Across the street by the park, artists were setting up their stalls unrolling their canvases, pinning up their watercolor reproductions of St. Patrick's Cathedral and the Brooklyn Bridge. We walked along in silence. My mind was whirring busily on my own troubles. Had Tom's parents got a call? Why hadn't I thought to ask him? As well as what I was going to order for breakfast as soon as I could get her to the diner. Western omelet with home fries, side of bacon, she would have what she always had, rye toast with poached eggs and a cup of black coffee. And I was hardly paying attention where we were going when I realized she had just said something. She wasn't looking at me, but out over the park. And her expression made me think of a famous French movie I didn't know the name of where distracted people walked down windblown streets and talked a lot, but didn't actually seem to be talking to each other. What did you say? I asked, after a few confused beats, walking faster to catch up with her. Try more. She looked startled, as if she'd forgotten I was there. The white coat flapping in the wind added to her long-legged ibis quality, as if she were about to unfurl her wings and sail away over the park. Try more what? Oh, her face was blank, and then she shook her head and laughed quickly in the sharp childlike way she had. No, I said time warp. Even though it was a strange thing to say, I knew what she meant or thought I did. That shiver of disconnection, that missing seconds on the sidewalk, like a hiccup of lost time or a few frames snipped out of a film. No, no puppy, just the neighborhood. Tossling her hair, making me smile in a lopsided half embarrassed way, puppy, was my baby name. I disliked it. I didn't like it anymore, nor the hair tussling either. But sheepish though I felt, I was glad to see her in a better mood. Always happens up here. Whenever I'm here, it's like I'm 18 again and right off the bus. Here, I said doubtfully, permitting her to hold my hand, not formally, something I would have done. That's weird. 
I knew all about my mother's early days in Manhattan, a good long way from Fifth Avenue on Avenue B, in a studio above a bar where Bum slept in the doorway and her, the fight, bar fights spilled out on the street and a crazy old lady named Mo kept 10 or 12 illegal cats in a blocked off stairwell on the top, top floor. She shrugged. Yeah, but up here it's all the same as the first day I ever saw it. Time tunnel. On the Lower East Side, well, you know what it's like down there, always something new. But for me, it's more this Rip Van Winkle feeling, always further and further away. Some days I'd wake up and it was like they came in and rearranged the storefronts in the night. Old restaurants out of business, some trendy new bar where the dry cleaners used to be. I maintained a respectful silence. The passage of time had been much on her mind lately, maybe because her birthday was coming up. I'm too old for this routine, she'd said a few days before as we'd scrambled together over the apartment, rummaging under the sofa cushions and searching in the pockets of coats and pockets and jackets for enough change to pay the delivery boy from the deli. She dug her hands in her coat pockets. Up here it's more stable, she said, though her voice was light. I could see the fog in her eyes. Clearly, she hadn't slept well, thanks to me. Upper Park is one of the few places where you could still see what the city looked like in the 1890s. Gramercy Park, too, and the village, some of it. When I first came to New York, I thought this neighborhood was Edith Wharton and Fanny and Zoe and break, breakfast at Tiffany's all rolled into one. Franny and Zoe was the West Side. Yeah, but I was too dumb to know that. All I can say is it was pretty different from the Lower East. Homeless guys starting fires in trash cans. Up here on the weekends, it was magical. Wandering the museum, lolloping around Central Park on my own. Lolloping? <laughs> So much of her talk was exotic to my ear and lollop sounded like some horse term from her childhood. A lazy gallop, maybe. Some equine gait between a canter and a trot. Oh, you know, just lopping and sloping around, along like I do, no money, holes in my socks, living off oatmeal. But even or not, I used to walk up here some weekends, saving my train fare for the ride home. That was when they still had tokens instead of cards. And even though you're supposed to pay to get to the museum, the suggested donation, well, I guess I must have had a lot more nerve back then. Or maybe they just left, felt sorry for me because, oh no, she said in a changed tone, stopping cold so that I walked a few steps by her without noticing. What? Turning back, what is it? Felt something, she held out her palm and looked at the sky. Did you? And just as she said it, the light seemed to fail. The sky darkened rapidly, darker every second. The wind rustled the trees in the park and the new leaves on the trees stood out tender and yellow against black clouds. Jeez, wouldn't you know it, said my mother. It's about to pour. Leaning over the street, looking north, no cabs. I caught her hand, come on, I said. We'll have better luck on the other side. Impatiently, we waited for the last few blinks on the don't walk sign. Bits of paper were whirling in the air and tumbling down the street. Hey, there's a cab, I said, looking up fifth. And just as I said it, a businessman ran to the curb with his hand up and the light popped off. Across the street, artists ran to cover their paintings with plastic. The coffee vendor was pulling down the shutters on his cart. We hurried across and just as we made it to the other side, a fat drop of rain splashed on my cheek. Sporadic brown circles, widely spaced, big as dimes began to pop up on the paper. Oh, drat, cried my mother. She fumbled in her bag for her umbrella, which was scarcely big enough for one person, let alone two. And then it came down. Curled sweeps of rain blowing in subways, broad gusts tumbling in the treetops and flapping in the awnings across the street. My mother was struggling to get the cranky little umbrella up without much success. <clears throat> People on the street and in the park were holding newspapers and briefcases over their heads, scurrying up the stairs to the portico of the museum, 
which was the only place on the street to get out of the rain. And there was something festive and happy about the two of us, hurrying up the steps beneath a flimsy candy striped umbrella. Quick, 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 for all the world as if we were escaping something terrible instead of running right into it. Three important things that happened to my mother after she arrived in New York on the bus from Kansas, friendless and practically penniless. The first was when a booking agency agent named Davy Joe Pickering had spotted her waiting tables in a coffee shop in the village. An underfed teenager in Doc Martens and thrift shop clothes with a braid down her back so long she sat on it. When she brought him his coffee, he had offered her 700 and then $1,000 to fill in for a girl who had shown up for work at the catalog shoot across the street. He had pointed out the location van, the equipment being set up on Sheridan Square Park. He had counted out the bills, laid them on the counter. Give me 10 minutes, she said. She brought out with the rest of her breakfast orders, then hung up her apron and walked out. I was only a mail order model, she always took pains to explain to people, by which she meant she'd never done fashion magazines or couture, only circulars for chain stores, inexpensive casuals for junior misses in Missouri and Montana. Sometimes it was fun, she said, but mostly it wasn't swimsuits. Mostly it wasn't. Swimsuits in January, shivering from flu, tweeds and woolens and summer heat, sweltering for hours amid fake autumn leaves while a studio fan blew hot air and a guy from makeup darted in between takes to powder the sweat off your nose. But during those years of standing around and pretending to be in college, posing in mock campus settings in stiff pairs and threes, books clutched to her chest, She'd managed to sock away enough money to send herself to college for real. Art history at NYU. She'd never seen a great painting in person until she was 18 and moved to New York. And she was eager to make up for lost time. Pure bliss, pure heaven, she'd said, up to the neck in art books and poring over the same old slides Manet, Vuillard, until her vision started to blur. It's crazy, she said, but I'd be perfectly happy if I could sit looking in the same half dozen paintings for the rest of my life. I can't think of a better way to go insane. College was the second important thing that had happened to her in New York. For her, probably the most important. And if not, for the third thing, meeting and marrying my father, not so lucky as the first two, she would almost certainly have finished her master's degree and gone on for her PhD. Whenever she had a few hours to herself, she always said it straight to the Frick or MoMA or the Met, which is why as we stood under the dripping portico of the Metropolitan Museum, gazing out across hazy Fifth Avenue and the raindrops jumping white in the street, I was not surprised when she shook her umbrella out and said, Maybe we should go in and poke around for a bit till it stops. Um, what I wanted was breakfast. Sure. She glanced at her watch. Might as well, we're not going to get a cab and all this. She was right. Still, I was starving. When are we going to eat? I thought grumpily following her up the stairs. For all I knew, she was going to be so mad after the meeting, she wouldn't take me out to lunch at all. I would have to go home and eat a bowl of cereal or something. Yet the museum always felt like a holiday. And once we were inside with the glad roar of tourists all around us, I felt strangely insulated from whatever else the day might hold in store. The great hall was loud and rank with the smell of wet overcoats. A drenched crowd of Asian senior citizens surged past after a crisp stewardessy guide Bedraggled Girl Scouts huddled whispering near the coat check. Beside the information desk stood a line of military school cadets in gray dress uniforms, hats off, clasped hands behind their backs. For me, a city kid, always confined by apartment walls, the museum was interesting mainly because of its immense size. A palace where the rooms went on forever and grew more and more deserted the farther in you went. Some of the neglected 
bed chambers and roped off drawing rooms in the depths of European decorating felt bound up in deep enchantment as if no one had set foot in them for hundreds of years. Ever since I started riding the train by myself, I'd love to go there alone and roam around until I got lost, wandering deeper and deeper in the maze of galleries until sometimes I found myself in forgotten halls of armor and porcelain that I'd never seen before and occasionally was unable to find again. As I hung behind my mother in the admissions line, I put my head back and stared fixedly into the cavernous ceiling dome two stories above. If I stared hard enough, sometimes I could make myself feel like I was floating around up there, like a feather, a trick from early childhood that was fading as I caught older. Meanwhile, my mother, red-nosed and breathless from our dash through the rain, was grappling for her wallet. Maybe when we're done, I'll dock in the gift shop, she was saying. I'm sure the last thing Mathilde wants is an art book, but it'll be hard for her to complain much about it without sounding stupid. Yikes, I said, the presents for Mathilde. Mathilde was the art director of the advertising firm where my mother worked. She was the daughter of a French fabric importing magnate. Younger than my mother and notoriously fussy, apt to throw tantrums if the car service or the, or the catering wasn't up to par. Yep, wordlessly she offered me a stick of gum, which I accepted and then threw the pack back in her purse. I mean, that's Mathilde's whole thing. The well-chosen gift shouldn't cost a lot of money. It's all about the perfect inexpensive paperweight from the flea market. That would be fantastic, of course, if any of us had time to go downtown and scour the flea market. Last year when it was Prue's turn, she panicked and ran into sacks on her lunch hour and ended up spending 50 bucks of her own money on top of what they gave her for sunglasses. Tom Ford, I think. And Mathilde still had to get her crack in about Americans and consumer culture. Prue isn't even American, she's Australian. Have you discussed it with Sergio, I said. Sergio, seldom in the office, though often in the society pages with people like Donatella Versace, was the multimillionaire owner of my mother's firm. Discussing things with Sergio was akin to asking, what would Jesus do? Sergio's idea of an art book is Helmut Newton, or maybe that coffee table book that Madonna did a while back. I started to ask who Helmut Newton was, but then had a better idea. Why don't you get her a Metro card? My mother rolled her eyes. Believe me, I ought to. They had recently been a flap at work <clears> until <throat> the car was held up in traffic, leaving her stranded in Williamsburg at a jeweler's coffin. Like anonymously, leave one on her desk and one without any money on it, just to see what she'd do. I can tell you what she'd do, said my mother, sliding her membership card through the ticket counter. Fire her assistant and probably half the people in production as well. My mother's advertising firm specialized in women's accessories all day long under the agitated and sudden, slightly vicious eyes of Matilda, who supervised photo shoots where crystal earrings glistened on drifts of fake holiday snow and crocodile handbags unattended in the back seats of deserted limousines glowed in coronas of celestial light. She was good at what she did. She preferred working behind the camera rather than in front of it. And I knew she got a kick out of seeing her work on su subway posters and on billboards in time. <laughs> but despite the gloss and sparkle of the job, champagne breakfasts, gift bags from Bergdorf's, the hours were long and there was a hollowness at the heart of it all. I knew maybe her sad, what she really wanted was to go back to school Though, of course, we both knew that there was little chance of that. Now my father had uh, left. Okay, she said, turning from the window and handing me my badge. Keep me, uh, help me keep an eye on the time, will you? It's a massive show, she indicated a poster. Portraiture and Nature Mort, Northern Masterworks of the Golden Age. We can't see it all on this visit, but there are a few things. I really hate to race through it like this, she was saying as I caught up with her at the top of the stairs. But then again, it's the kind of show where you need to come two or three times. 
There's the anatomy lesson, and we do have to see that. But what I really want to see is one tiny, rare piece by a painter who was Vermeer's teacher, greatest old master you've ever known. The Franz Hals paintings are a big deal, too. You know Hals, don't you? The, the jolly toper and the almshouse governess. Right, I said tentatively of the paintings you mentioned. The anatomy lesson was the only one I knew. A detail from it was featured on the poster for the exhibition. Livid flesh, multiple shades of black, alcoholic looking surgeons with bloodshot eyes and red noses. Art 101 stuff, said my mother. Here, take a left. I was not excited at the prospect of a lot of pictures of Dutch people standing around in dark clothes. And when we pushed through the glass doors from echoing halls into carpeted hush, I thought at first we'd gone into the wrong hall. The walls glowed with a warm, dull haze of opulence, a generic mellowness of antiquity. But then it all broke apart into clarity and color and pure Northern light. Portraits, interiors, still life, some tiny, others majestic. Ladies and husbands, ladies and lap dogs, lonely beauties and embroidered gowns and splendid solitary merchants and jewels and furs. Ruined banquet tables littered with peeled apples and walnut shells, draped tapestries and silver. Trompe l'oeil with craw craw crawling insects and striped flowers. And the deeper we wandered, the stranger and more beautiful the pictures became. Peeled lemons with the rind slightly hardened at the knife's edge, the greenish shadow of a patch of mold, light striking the rim of a half empty wine glass. They really knew how to work this edge, the Dutch painters, ripeness sliding into rot. My mother, who'd been standing a bit too close, stepped back to regard the painting oblivious to the gum chewing security guard whose attention she had attracted who was staring fixedly at her back. Well, the Dutch invited the, invented the microscope, she said. They were jewelers, grounders of lenses. They went at it all as detailed as possible because even the tiniest details mean something. Whenever you see flies or insects in a still life, a wilted petal, a black spot on an apple, the painter is giving you a secret message. He's telling you that living things don't last. It's all temporary. Death is life. That's why they're called nature mort. Maybe you don't see it at first with all the beauty and bloom, the little speck of rot. But if you look closer, there it is. Now, Rembrandt, my mother said. <clears throat> Rembrandt, everybody always th thinks this painting is about reason and enlightenment, the dawn of scientific inquiry, all that. But to me, it's creepy how polite and formal they are, milling around the slab like a buffet at a cocktail party. She'd seen others paintings too that she wanted to bring me to. We'd been eyeing each other as we were going through the galleries. But it was obvious she was in search of one particular painting. This is the one I was talking about, she says. Isn't it amazing? I inclined my head to my mother's direction in an attitude of attentive listening while my eyes wandered back to the girl that I had noticed a few moments earlier. She was accompanied by a funny old white-haired character who I guessed from his sharpness of face was related to her. Her grandfather, maybe. Houndstooth coat, long narrow lace-up shoes as shiny as glass. His eyes were close set and his nose beaky and bird-like. He walked with a limp. This is just about the first painting I ever really loved, my mother was saying. You'll never believe it, but it was in a book I used to take out of the library when I was a kid. I used to sit on the floor by my bed and stare at it for hours, completely fascinated. That little guy. And I mean, actually, it's a question. It's incredible how much you can learn about a painting by spending a lot of time with a reproduction. And can even learn a lot, even if it's a good reproduction. The girl and the old man had come up next to us. Self-consciously, I leaned forward and looked at the painting. It was a small picture, the smallest in the exhibition, and the simplest. A yellow finch. 
against a plain pale ground, chained to a perch by its twig of an ankle. He was Rembrandt's pupil, Vermeer's teacher, my mother said. And this one little painting is really the missing link between the two of them, that clear, pure daylight. You can see where Vermeer, Vermeer gets his quality of light. Of course, I didn't know or care about any of that when I was a kid, the historical significance, but it's there. I stepped back to get a better look. It was a direct and matter of fact little creature with nothing sentimental about it and something about the neat compact way it tucked down inside itself. Its brightness, its alert watchful expression made me think of pictures I'd seen of my mother when she was small, a dark capped finch with steady eyes. It was a famous tragedy in Dutch history, my mother was saying. A huge part of the town was destroyed. A what? A, the disaster at Delft that killed Fabricius, the, the artist. Did you hear the teacher back there telling the children about it? I had. There had been a trio of ghastly landscapes by a painter named Egbert van der Poel. Different views of the same smoldering wasteland, burnt ruined houses, a windmill with tattered sails, crows wheeling in smoky skies. An official looking lady had been explaining loudly to a group of middle-class kids <clears throat> that a gunpowder factory exploded at Delft in the 1600s, that the painter had been so haunted and obsessed by the destruction of his city that he painted it over and over. Well, Egbert was Fabricius's neighbor. He sort of lost his mind after the powder explosion, at least that's how it looks to me. But Fabricius was killed and his studio was destroyed, <clears throat> along with almost all his paintings except this one. She seemed to be waiting for me to say something, but when I didn't, she continued, he was one of the greatest painters of his day, in one of the greatest ages of painting. Very, very famous in his time. It's sad though, because maybe only five or six paintings survived of all his work. All the rest of it is lost. Everything he ever did, except the goldfinch. The girl and her grandfather were loitering quietly to the side, listening to my mother talk, which was a bit embarrassing. I glanced away and then unable to resist, glanced back. They were standing very close so close I could have reached out and touched them. She was batting and plucking at the old man's sleeve, tugging his arm to whisper something in his ear. Anyway, if you ask me, my mother was saying, this is the most extraordinary picture in the whole show. Fabrizius is making clear something that he discovered all on his <laughs> own, that no painter in the world I knew before him not even Rembrandt. Very softly, so softly I could barely hear her. I heard the girl whisper, it had to live its whole life like that? I'd been wondering the same thing. The shackled foot, the chain was terrible. Her grandfather murmured some reply, but my mother who seemed totally unaware of them, even though they were right next to us, stepped back and said, such a mysterious picture, so simple, really tender. Invites you to stand close, you know, all those dead pheasants back there. And then this little living creature, this goldfinch. I allowed myself another stealthy glimpse in the girl's direction. She was standing on one leg with her hips swung out to the side. Then quite suddenly she turned and looked me in the eye and in a heart skip of confusion, I looked away. What was her name? Why wasn't she in school? I've been trying to make out the scribbled name on the flute case, but even when I, then, when I leaned in as far as I dared without being obvious, still I couldn't read the bold spiky marker strokes, more drawn than written, like something spray painted on a subway car. The last name was short, only four or five letters. The first looked like R, or was it a P? People die, sure, my mother was saying, but it's so heartbreaking and unnecessary how we lose things from pure carelessness. 
fires, wars, the Parthenon used as a munitions storehouse. I guess that anything we manage to save from history is a miracle. The grandfather had drifted away a few paintings over, but she was loitering a few steps behind the girl and kept casting glances back at my mother and me. Beautiful skin, milky white arms like carved marble. Definitely she looked athletic, though too pale to be a tennis player. Maybe she was a ballerina or a gymnast or even a high diver practicing late in shadowy indoor pools, echoes and refractions, dark tile, plunging with arched chest and pointed toes to the bottom of the pool, a silent pow, shiny black swimsuit, bubbles foaming and streaming off her small tense frame. Why did I obsess over people like this? Was it normal to fixate on strangers in this particular vivid, fevered way? I don't think so. It was impossible to imagine some random passerby on the street forming quite such an interest in me. And yet it was the main reason I'd gone to these houses with Tom. I was fascinated by strangers, what movies they watched and what music they listened to, wanted to look under their beds and in their secret drawers and night tables and inside the pockets of their coats. Once I saw interesting people on the street and thought about them restlessly for days, imagining their lives, making up stories about them on the subway or the crosstown bus. Years had passed and I still hadn't stopped thinking about the dark haired children in Catholic school uniforms, brother and sister I had seen in Grand Central, literally trying to pull their father out of the door of a seedy bar by the sleeves of his suit jacket. Nor had I forgotten the frail gypsyist girl in a wheelchair of slightly wild quality as of some steady eyed hunting creature alone on a plant. You know, my mother looked over her shoulder, if you don't mind, I just might run back and take another quick look at the anatomy lesson, the goldfinch, before we leave. I didn't get to see it up close, and I'm afraid I might not make it back before it comes down. She started away, shoes clacking busily, and then glanced at me as if to say, are you coming? This was so unexpected that for a split second, I didn't know what to say. Mm, I said, recovering, I'll meet you in the shop. Okay, she said. Buy me a couple of cards, will you? I'll be back in a sec. And off she hurried before I had a chance to say a word. Heart pounding, unable to believe my luck. I watched her walking rapidly away from me in the white satin trench coat. That was it. My chance to talk to the girl. But what can I say to her? I thought furiously, what can I say? I dug my hands in my pockets, took a breath or two to compose myself and excitement fizzing bright in my stomach turned to face her. But to my consternation, she was gone. That is to say, she wasn't gone. There was her red head moving reluctantly or so it seemed across the room. Her grandpa had slipped his arm through hers and whispering to her with great enthusiasm was towing her away to look at some picture on the opposite wall. I could have killed him. Nervously, I glanced at the empty doorway. Then I dug my hands deeper in my pockets and face burning, walked conspicuously across the length of the gallery. The clock was ticking. My mother would be back any second. And though I knew I didn't have the nerve to barge up and actually say something, I could at the very least get a last good look at her. Not long before I had stayed up late with my mother and watched Citizen Kane. And I was very taken with the idea that a person might notice in passing some bewitching stranger and remember her for the rest of his life. Someday I too might be the old man in the movie leaning back in my chair with a far off look in my eyes and saying, you know, that was 60 years ago and I never saw that girl with the red hair again. But you know what? <clears throat> Not a month has gone by in all that time when I haven't thought of her. I was more than halfway across the gallery when something strange happened. A museum guard ran across the open doorway of the exhibition shop where my mother was. He was carrying something in his arms. The girl saw it too. Her golden brown eyes met mine, 
a startled, quizzical look. Suddenly another guard flew out of the museum shop. His arms were up and he was screaming. Heads went up. Someone behind me said in an odd, flat voice, oh, the next instant, a tremendous ear-splitting blast shook the room. The old man with a blank look on his face stumbled sideways. His outstretched arm, knotty fingers spread as the last thing I remember seeing. At almost exactly the same moment, there was a black flash with debris sweeping and twisting around me and a roar of hot wind slammed into me and threw me across the room. And that was the last thing I knew for a while. Well, I didn't get to page 47, but I got to the point that I needed to make sure I got to. Obviously a huge explosion coming from the gift shop. So you can obviously understand the author's elements that stay with the rest of this book. The girl in the red hair, the old man, the mother, and above all, probably other than the boy himself, the painting called The Goldfinch. It's a wonderful book to read. <clears throat> I hope I at least have you at least tantalized. I shan't tell you anything that happens next because I wouldn't want to give it away, but all of those elements play a very key role in this boy in the next 14 years of his life. He was 27. You may have put that together at the first chapter when he's in Amsterdam. Uh, and that is close to uh, the end of the book, but it also starts the book. So this follows the boy from 13 after this enormous blast at the Metropolitan Museum of Art to age 27 and a very, very circuitous route. And it's beautiful. And the goldfinch, well, the goldfinch, the goldfinch, that's all I'll say. Thank you so much for being with me today. I'm terribly sorry for some of our technical difficulties. <clears throat> I have no idea where this frog came from all of a sudden, and we paused for a second there and then had some sound problems. So I do apologize, uh, but thank you so much for being with us uh, through this rush of the goldfinch. Please do read the rest. As always, I'd like to tell you a little bit about what we're going to do next week. Uh, we're going to make a very big switch next week to New England, back to New England. A book written in 1928, uh, which became over the years, one of the most indispensable nature books we have in our literature. However, that's not why I love the book. The book is called The Outermost House. It is subtitled, A Year of Life on the Great Beach of Cape Cod. It is written by Henry Beston, Henry Beston at age 36 in the summer of 1924 uh, went to what was called then the Coast Guard Beach on Cape Cod. For those of you who know Cape Cod well, you know that it's pretty much an elbow, but then the forearm goes straight up and then the hand comes right around to the end of Provincetown. So this is the uh, forearm part of the outer beach of Cape Cod. He went to, to Coast Guard Beach, it's now called East Ham Beach. Uh, in 1925, he came back and bought 50 acres of dune land, 50 acres of dunes. And he built a two room cottage. <laughs> and in September, 1926, he went to stay there for two weeks and he stayed for a year. So it's the story of a man living in the dunes of outer Cape Cod uh, in 1928. Uh, for those of you who are bird watchers, it's terrific uh, for bird watchers, but it's wonderful for observing what goes on. Uh, he's such an observant man. So we're going to hop around quite a bit next week, uh, but I think you'll find it fascinating. And could you do it? One year in a two-room hut in a sand dune on Cape Cod, 
think about it. I hope you'll join us next week. <laughs> we do have a dedicated email address in case you wish to comment on today, or if you'd like to suggest a book, perhaps. Uh, it is very simple, friday-explorations, with an S, at usa.net, friday-explorations at usa.net. So please send us a note. We'd love to hear from you, and we love uh, suggestions. I hope you have a good week as summer continues on, as we come into September by the time I see you again. Uh, for next week's The Outermost House, uh, I shall see you in September. Sounds like a song. Thank you again. Have a great week and goodbye. <laughs>